Hey, I just want to jump in real quick and let you know about our free private Facebook group that I've just started for all our podcast listeners. Now, this is a great place for all ambitious Christians. We can talk about all the latest strategies and tips and advice we've learned from everything from inside or outside of this podcast, everything there is to do about achieving your God dream. I'll leave a link in the show notes down below where you can check it out and join for free. Also, if you're enjoying the Son of Man podcast, I'd really appreciate it if you could leave a five-star review. This will help me on my journey to empower more ambitious Christians from all over the world, just like yourself. But anyway, let's get on with the show. Hey, I'm Paul and welcome to the Son of Man podcast. This is a podcast for ambitious Christians who are working towards their God dreams. For me, God has put it on my heart to end homelessness in New Zealand. So join me on this journey as I talk with experts about how we can learn more about God, dive deeper into our finances, have better relationships, work smarter, set better goals and live healthier lives so we can achieve our God dreams. If this is something you're interested in, make sure you follow this podcast on whatever platform you're currently listening to this on. And without further ado, let's get right into this week's episode. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to episode number 29 of the Son of Man podcast. And I'm actually recording this intro after I've edited this episode. And I actually just got all four of my wisdom teeth cut out. So I'm going to try bang through this intro quickly, just get on with the episode. But this is episode number 29 with William Attaway. Now, he is the author of Catalytic Leadership, 12, te- 12 keys sorry, to becoming an intentional leader that makes a difference. And if you are a leader, if you want to be a leader, or if you're just... If you're just a Christian, this is going to be such good information for you. We talk about uh, what Catholic leadership actually is, cultivating a teachable spirit, discovering our wiring, uh, pursuing intentional growth, being action-orientated, and so much more. And guys, this is really going to blow your mind when it comes to leadership, leading people, leading yourself. This is a value-packed episode all about leadership from start to finish, everything you need to know. Well, uh, maybe not everything, but it's a good start, and it'll get you on the right track. To transform your communities and your teams and your organizations. So without further ado, here's episode 29 of the Son of Man podcast. William Edway, welcome to the Son of Man podcast. How are you? I'm doing great, man. Thanks so much for having me on today. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. I, I, I didn't say this in the intro, but I, you are from South, well, from the United States, but from the Southern parts, and I'm going to enjoy listening to your accent this whole time. So, thank you for jumping. <laughs> I'm so glad. <laughs> nah, like I, the, this. Oh, actually, there's probably not any accents I hate, but I do love a good Southern Southern accent. So, you said, were you originally from Alabama? Is that what you said? Originally from Alabama, I uh, lived in, in Alabama and Mississippi, and then Texas, and now I live in Northern Virginia. Mm, that's great. What's What's in Northern Virginia that someone uh, from not from? America, no. So I'm, I'm in the suburbs, the western suburbs of Washington D.C. Uh, it's a it's a very large oh, right. area of people who commute into the city, uh, oh. and so uh, I'm part of that. Most of my neighbors commute into the city or into the closer suburbs. So do you do you work in Washington D.C.? I do not. I work in the western suburbs, actually. Oh, okay. Uh, Pastor I don't church know. there. Mm, I don't know my geography. Sorry, so I'm kind of exposing myself, but. You're all good. <laughs> but that's all good. So, uh, we mentioned briefly about you, but why don't you get us started talking about a little bit about your background? You've obviously written Catalytic Leadership, so we're obviously going to be talking about leadership, and your subtitle was 12 Keys to Becoming an Intentional Leader Who Makes a Difference, and we're going to be jumping into some of those today, but what has brought you to that point where you wanted to first of all write that book, and what's led to that point? You know, when I was, when I was 15 years old, uh, I had a high school teacher who invited me to attend a leadership conference, my first one. Mm-hmm. He saw something in me that I did not see in myself. And I went and I listened and I learned and I was hooked. I've been a student of leadership for over three decades now. I've been a practitioner for almost that long uh, in different organizations in business and then in the local church for the last 25 years. And what I have learned is, is that developing leaders, pouring into and investing in other leaders, helping them to get better is how God wired me. And that's what I have devoted the best waking hours of my day to for decades now. Uh, The book actually comes out of that. Uh, Not only do I work as a pastor in the local church and develop leaders in that context, but I've begun to work as a leadership coach and for decades have been pouring into and developing leaders across disciplines, from government employees and contractors to educators to C-suite types and entrepreneurs and solopreneurs. And I found that there are principles that apply no matter your context when it comes to leadership. And that's what the book captures is the, the things I've learned over my decades in leadership and that I've learned in my conversations with the clients that I coach. Mm. Yeah, that's amazing. Because I think often a lot of people just get put in leadership positions without actually having any, not necessarily no experience, but sort of not really not. You kind of, there's there's a thing in leadership where people, can't, you kind of just have to learn by doing, yes. which when you're responsible for people can be a dangerous thing if you don't know what you're doing. 
depending mm-hmm. on the context for some reason for some context it might not really matter that much but for some context especially like with what you do in church and stuff that could be a really damaging experience if people don't know what they're doing with leadership and it is actually a really important thing for people to understand and also leadership is probably a thing where it's not actually just for people who are in a leadership role but you can you'd probably say that everyone has aspects of their life where they're a leader right that's exactly right if you have influence john maxwell has said so well if you have influence mm you exercise leadership because leadership right. is simply influence. Right. Yeah, well, you've, you've got these 12 chapters that are the bulk of your book and we're, we're going to jump into some of these few ones to get started to sort of learn about your thoughts a little bit and learn some stuff about leadership. The first one is, uh, well, what I want to ask is it's all about cultivating a teachable spirit. And so what does that mean to you? And like, why is that important? And what can we do to do that in our lives? I think there's no such thing as a wasted experience. Yeah, I think I think God never wastes an experience in our lives. And the, the question is, are we going to come at that with a learning posture? Are we going to come to it and say, what can I learn here? I think you can learn from any experience, any crisis, any difficulty, any success. I think you can learn from anybody. Sometimes you learn what not to do. <laughs> that can be incredibly valuable. Mm. And so a teachable spirit is is cultivating in your life that posture. That's a decision. It's a choice that you make and I make every single day. Nobody else makes it for us. We're going to say, I choose to come at this with a learning posture, with a teachable spirit. How do you cultivate that? Well, that's the people mm. you spend time with. That's the, the inputs in your life, the books you read, the podcasts you listen to, the workshops, the seminars, the conferences you attend. That's the, the, the environment that you're in. All of these things contribute to what you're cultivating in your life. Are you being intentional about that? And so that's what I talk about in the book is, is how important this is. If you want to be catalytic in your leadership, then, then you have to cultivate a teachable spirit and understand that every opportunity, every day is a chance to learn something, a chance mm. to grow. Mm. What do you think people struggle with the most when it comes to that? I would guess is probably people struggling to ask for feedback or something. But what has been your experience with people struggling? Like, why do people find that hard? I think over time, the longer you do something, the more comfortable you get with it. Mm. You know, when you when you start something new, you you begin to you, you have a, such a steep learning curve, a steep growth curve at the beginning that you you have to be in a learning posture. You're forced into it. But over time, you get comfortable, right? And right. and that comfort level means you don't you don't have to learn at the pace you were. You don't have to ask as many questions. And that creates a drift. It's what I call a drift into mediocrity. Mm. Uh, nobody ever drifts into excellence. We only drift right. into mediocrity. Mm. Uh, and the way you get there is you stop learning. You stop right. cultivating a teachable spirit. Right. And what would be some easy ways to get started in that process then? If we want to get into a habit of getting a teachable spirit, what are some easy ways people can get started with it? I think think about the people that you spend the most time with, the people mm. that you choose to spend the most time with. Are these people who are farther down the road than you are, people that you are learning from and being inspired by? Or are they people who are people that you don't want to learn from and be inspired by, right? Mm. You look at their lives and you say, is this, is this somebody who's going to help me go where I want to go? Uh, mm. We choose the people that we spend so much of our time with. And, and my question is always, are these people who are going to help me? Are they inspiring me to do better, to be the best version of myself? I will frequently, and I've done this my whole career, I will reach out to leaders who are further down the road than I am in whatever I'm doing and offer to buy them coffee, offer to buy them lunch Mm -hmm. and come with questions and say, hey, I want to know in this area, like, what have you learned? What what, what are the things that that have helped you become what you are? And I just listen and I ask questions and I listen. And, And by doing that, that's putting into me the benefit of their experience. I'm not going to live long enough to make every single mistake myself. I'm just not. I want to avoid as many as I can. And Mm. the only way I know to avoid the ditches that are sure to be all around me is to benefit from the experience of other people. But in order to do that, I've got to ask and be intentional about the people that I'm spending time with. Right. Yeah, that's amazing. I think, thank you for sharing that, those practical things. Um, I think my experience has been a lot of people are actually down to talk if you hit them up and be like, hey, do you want to go grab a coffee? And do you want to like, 
you know, like I've done it before and it actually just works. I, I often been scared to do that. Like, oh, I don't know. They might say no. Uh, for me, right. having a fear of rejection is like a big thing, to be honest. Like that's one thing that I'm actually like terrified of. Like I, even if it's just that, they'll be like, oh, sorry, like kind of busy at the moment. Like I'm scared of that happening. But a lot of people are actually very open and accommodating if you want to go take them out for the coffee or something cost you five dollars and then you can right. spend an hour just soaking up all of the information they have so i think that's a really good practical and sometimes hard because sometimes you have hard conversations within those conversations yes. and those are, aren't necessarily fun but that's where we grow the most i think well don't say they're no forum you know so often mm. you know that fear can cause us to say well they would probably not they don't have time they're too busy they don't they don't want to spend time with me they, you know, they're, mm. they're not going to listen to all my questions you're saying there are no forum. <laughs> Make the ask. Right. You know, I haven't gotten a yes to every ask I've made mm. for a leader to sit down with me. I haven't. Not even close. But I, the, every yes that I got only happened because I asked. Right. And they're not going to ask you to go out. They, you know, they got they're stuff. Not. To, they're they not don't hit you me. up. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, I'm going to go out of order a little bit. Um, yeah. We're going to skip. Well, not skip. We'll come back to a few chapters. But I think what will tie into this really well is your sixth chapter, which is how can we evaluate ruthlessly. Mm -hmm. And so I yeah. thought jumping on what we're just talking about um, about learning having a teachable spirit after that we want to evaluate what's working what's not working what do you see as being an effective way to evaluate our leadership you know some some 16 years ago i read a book called getting things done by david allen all right and it's a book i recommend to my coaching clients all the time uh, because it had such an impact on my life david allen talks about the value of a weekly review as part of the gtd mm. methodology and that is a non-negotiable part of my life and has been for 16 years Right. This is how I will look back. I will take every Sunday night, I will look back at the previous week and I'll look at it, at all the appointments, all the, the, the meetings. I'll think about emails and conversations and I'll review and I'll ask three questions. What mm -hmm. went right? And I'll celebrate the wins because right. too often we don't do that. Mm -hmm. We start with what went wrong. <laughs> I want to start with what went right. Yeah. You know, I think Andy Stanley's right. What's rewarded is repeated. I want to reward the wins, right? So I'm going to, I'm going to start there. Like, let's mm. replicate those if we can. What went right? What went wrong? Mm. Like, what are the things that didn't go right this week? What are the things that I screwed up? What are the things that I would do differently if I could? I want to review those. And third, how do we make it better next time? Right. What are some things I can do to learn from this? We have this idea. It's a myth, but we have this idea that that experience makes you better experience right. does not make you better evaluated mm. experience makes you better right there's a lot of people who have one year experience that they've repeated 30 times and they think mm. they've got 30 years of experience they really don't right. they have one year of experience they've just been doing the same thing and they haven't learned anything <laughs> okay True. evaluation is what makes the difference and that's why every week i want to evaluate i want to learn from them you have to do it ruthlessly you have to you have to mm. not hold back you're right. not going to benefit anybody if you try to cheat this. You're certainly not going to benefit yourself. So yeah. that's part of my, my rhythm. I'm going to evaluate. I'm going to look back and say, I want to learn what went right, what went wrong, how do we make it better, so that I can take those processed learnings forward into my next week. Mm -hmm. And I can benefit from those. So that when I encounter a similar situation, if it went right and I got a win before, I'm going to do that thing again. If it went <laughs> wrong and I've processed how I would do it differently, I have a chance to do it differently now. <laughs> right. I'm going to carry that forward. If I don't process that, if I don't review it, the chances are I'm not going to do those things. Yeah, that's super interesting that you said experience itself isn't actually helpful because that's what I've been told as well. Like just do stuff over and over and you will get better at it. But in reality, evaluating is probably a key process that a lot of people don't actually implement because it's not something you really get taught. I mean, right. I, I say out there, people know that that's the thing, but like you don't consciously think about that as an important step in growing in whatever skill you're trying to grow in. So I think that's super helpful. I'm so excited about this this podcast. I think this is going to be amazing. I've already, I, I already learned so much from this just already and we're only, what, 10 minutes in. So thank <laughs> so you that, thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah. Let me well, say one did, more thing if I could yeah, to ahead. that. Yep. that. I've talked about how I do that personally, mm. but it doesn't just stay there. I also do this with the team that I lead. Mm. They know those three questions because we ask them every single week about right. just about everything we do, right? Mm. Because I want to reward the wins team-wise, department-wise. I want to reward the wins organizationally, 
right? Mm -hmm. Because what's rewarded is repeated. I want these things to continue. I want people to understand what matters. What went wrong? How do we make it better? These are how we're going to improve. Improvement is not just going to happen in a team, in a department, in an organization. Mm. Are you going to be intentional about it? So the evaluation doesn't just apply personally. It has to begin there. But you have to take it to the next level if you're Mm. a leader and say, how am I going to use this to help other people get better that I'm working with as well? Right. I was actually going to ask you that if you ever do that with anyone else or is that just on your own? What is... If you're if you're just wanting to say you run a, you run a team and you're wanting to start some evalu- weekly evaluation process with them, and if you find them like sort of holding back and not wanting to bring up maybe potentially bad stuff because they find it awkward or something, do you have any advice as running a team meeting on how you can encourage people to share how they actually feel? Absolutely. First thing I would do is create an opportunity to share wins. That's where right. we start. That's the start the team meetings. We start with the wins. I have a we use Slack. And so in Slack, I have right. a channel called wins. And anybody mm. can add to that any day. And that's where we're gonna start. I'm gonna start there and I'm gonna we're gonna start there and say, hey, what wins have been shared? Hey, let's celebrate those. Let's celebrate what's going right. We're gonna celebrate that mm. first. We're not gonna immediately jump to, and let me tell you all the ways you've disappointed me and what you're doing wrong. <laughs> we're not gonna start there. We're gonna start mm. with the wins, right? Then we're going to move to what went wrong. Then we're going to move to how do we make it better. Mm. But we start with the wins because that's that's what I want to replicate. That's right. what I want to focus on. Mm. So I would say the first step is establish some mechanism. Maybe you use Slack and maybe it's a channel in Slack. Maybe it's a, a shared Google Drive document. Wh- whatever you use that, that can be a collaborative place, everybody has the opportunity to add wins. And then when you get together with your team, you start there. You celebrate those things. When you do that, not only are you celebrating the wins, not only are you rewarding things that you want to see repeated, but you're creating an environment for the team where they're going to be more open and more willing to share some of the hard things. Mm. Yeah, that's great. That's some great advice. Something that I wouldn't, it makes so much sense, but it's not something that I'd think about on my own. So thank thank you for sharing that. Um, We're going to, again, we're going to, I'm looking at the chapters. I'm trying to uh, do a cohesive story. And I think what would be interesting to talk about next is your third chapter um, about actively pursuing intentional growth. So mm-hmm. we've we've got a, a spirit of wanting to, uh, what was it? A teachable spirit, sorry. Where we're evaluating ruthlessly. What can we do then to intentionally grow? What does that look like to you? I think, again, there's this myth that, you know, one day we're going to wake up and we're going to say, Wow. I'm a fully mature leader, right? fully developed. I don't know how that happened, but here I am. <laughs> okay, mm-hmm. I've never seen that happen, ever. <laughs> it's not how that right. works. Yeah. So if that's not how that happens, how does it happen that we move toward maturity, that we mm-hmm. move toward leading with all diligence? How, how do we get there? Well, it's actively pursuing intentional growth. Now, Mm. this, again, goes back to the inputs in our life. This goes back to the people who speak into our lives, the people we spend time with. This goes back to the books that we read, the the discussions that we have, the podcasts that we listen to, the the workshops and seminars and conferences that Mm -hmm. we go to. What are the inputs in my life? If I don't have consistent inputs where I'm learning and I'm outside of my comfort zone, where I'm being challenged to grow beyond where I am currently, I'm not going to grow. Growth only happens on the other side of change. Mm. Yeah, that's great. What, uh, what, what do I want to ask? What, where do people struggle with growing intentionally? Like, what do you think holds people back? Because as you said, it's easy to kind of just coast and we can coast to mediocrity. Sure. But why do people do that? And why do you think it's so hard for people to actually be like, okay, I need to grow in this skill? What do you think's missing there? You know, most people would tell you if you ask them, Hey, do you need, is there anything you need to grow in? They could give you a thing or two or three. Right. They, they could fire that off. Yeah. But then when you take the next step and say, okay, so what's your plan? Mm. That's where it falls down because there is no plan. Right. And, and failing to plan, as has been said, is planning to fail. Right. Okay. You have to have a plan. This is what I work with with coaching clients. I help them to develop an intentional plan to grow in the areas where they want to grow. Mm. And then I hold them accountable to that. I say, okay, you said you want to do X, Y, Z. You said you want to move forward in this. Now, here's the plan that you and I put together, customized specifically for you, because I don't think there's one size fits all growth plan. Okay, now we have the intention, the desire, we have the focus, we have the plan. 
Now it's time mm. for the execution. Right. And I'm um, going to be the one who's mm. going to say, how's that going? Right. What When you're planning someone with, with someone, what are like, obviously everyone's different, which is great, but what are some general things you look at? Like high level, what do you think, if people want to come with a plan to grow, what are some high level things they need to think about that's going to lead to success for them? Like you say, everyone is different. You know, for some clients, it focuses more around leading their team. It focuses more around investing in people, seeing people not as cogs in a machine, but as actual 3D human beings that, right. that are not just what they do. Mm. Um, for some people, that's a growth area. Uh, for some people, a growth area is learning how to give the last 10% of honesty. You know, we, mm. we, we can usually give the first 90% with no problems, but we hold back because we don't want to hurt somebody's feelings or we don't want to, you know, get somebody bent out of sorts. Uh, it's understandable, but but in my experience, the last 10% of honesty is where the magic is. Uh, right. That's where the growth is. And so for some leaders, it's that. For for some leaders, it's learning internally how to deal with failure. It's how to deal with rejection. Mm. It's learning how to deal with imposter syndrome. It, it, there's, there's, there's so many different elements. And with each one of those, there's a different, there's a different path that we're going to walk down together. Right. Um, I think what leads into this really well is you've got a chapter about being boldly action oriented. Mm -hmm. well, what do you mean by that? And what are some of the key things that you mean by being action oriented? You know, I've, I've been studying leaders for over three decades now. I've right. read more biographies than I care to remember. I read more articles and, and have learned from and about more leaders than I, than I could possibly tell you. You know, one thing I, I don't remember the leaders mm. that I learned from, I don't remember too many of them being passive. <laughs> right. They're they're active. They're action oriented. Right. They have a bias for action. And so right. if that's true, and and these leaders that we learn from and, and and learn about have a bias for action, that's part of, of being a catalyst. You know, I get the the idea right. of catalytic leadership from I went to I went to college as a pharmacy major. Right. And that was that was what I was going to do, and yeah. I thought, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna study chemistry. I get to, to inorganic. I get to organic, and then I realized this is not what I want to spend the rest of my life doing. <laughs> but right. I learned yeah. in my brief chemistry studies the power of a catalyst. A catalyst is something that you introduce that will accelerate or incite significant change, that have a significant mm -hmm. impact. Right. Okay, that is every leader I've ever studied that I want to learn from. Mm. They incite or accelerate significant change in order to make a significant impact. So mm. catalytic leadership then is learning how to lead in such a way that you're going to make a difference. Mm. What do you think makes it hard for people to take action? Do you think people overcomplicate stuff? Do you think people spend too much time planning and not enough time executing? What do you think are the common themes you see in people of people not taking action? I think all of the above. I think overthinking is a major problem. Um, mm. I, but, but I think equally perhaps is fear, uh, right. fear of failure, fear of rejection, right. fear that it's not enough, fear that, that you're not enough, fear that the results won't be what you wanted, um, fear that, that it won't work. Uh, and right. I think that is a limiting belief that sabotages so many leaders before they ever take one step out of the starting block. Mm. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. How can what what are some of the easy things we can do then to address that? If there's if there's someone who wants to start a business, start a church, start something big that requires a lot of action, but they're scared, they've they're they're, they're afraid of failing, they're afraid of what people think of them when they do something like that. What are the common tips that you give someone like that who wants to take action but are scared to? No great thing is ever done alone. Right. That's the first thing I would say. Who are the people that you're spending time with? Who are the people who are pouring into you and that you are pouring into? Uh, mm. Understand that great things are done by teams and by community. Mm. Every great leader I've ever had a conversation with or that I've learned from talks about the value of the people around them. Yeah. And and too many people think it's all up to me and I've got to do it all. And if I don't do it, it won't get done. And man, that's a dangerous place to be because all of a sudden you're just you're just one step shy of savior syndrome and all of a sudden you just need to have your cape on so you can swoop in and save everybody and do all the things. Well, yeah, that's the that's the fast path to burnout is what that is. Right. Yeah, first of all, like, this is 
I, I ask you a question and then I think, okay, I know where he's going to go with this, but then you just go somewhere completely different. I'm like, damn, like I'm learning a lot. Like I, this is great. This is amazing. So thank you for that. But yeah, that's great what you said. I think the people around you are super important and everyone knows the quote, like show me your, your five closest people, whatever, and I'll show you your future. But again, that's probably an action thing. Like we know that, but then do people actually take action towards that? Like, Bingo. like, right. Do we, do we actually actively think about who we're spending time with how much time we're you know spending with the right people and yep. there's probably a hard line so say if there's someone like listening to this right now and they don't they have people they are friends with who are really nice to them but aren't taking them to where they want to go if they're super ambitious if that person is super ambitious but maybe their friends aren't on the same page with that what advice do you have would that be something like like spending time with people but virtually like does for you when we say that do you think mentors online say studying people's content online would that count in that situation or what are your thoughts around that absolutely it has to do with the inputs mm -hmm. right? right and if you can't add people to your sphere per personally mm -hmm. uh, there's so many ways to add people to your sphere virtually right <laughs> these days i mean yeah. I learn from people I have never met. I have mentors right. that have no idea who I am. <laughs> and I've learned from them for 20 and 30 years. Mm. That's the beauty and the value of the age in which we live. If I choose to avail myself of that, then I benefit and everybody I serve benefits. If I mm. don't, that is 100% on me. Right. Yeah, great. Um, okay, one thing that's... I like to talk about, and I know it's in your book, is there's, what's the chapter called? One second. Um, discover your wiring. And I yeah. remember reading this, and there's a lot of stuff about personality tests when it comes to creating a team, when it comes to understanding people better. Uh, what did you learn writing that chapter, and what are the some key things about discovering your wiring? You know, Paul, one of the things that, that I've learned over time is that every leader has a unique wiring. And in fact, every right. person has a unique wiring. God has created each one of us on purpose for a purpose. Mm -hmm. And and when a new leader begins to lead, what, what I find and what I experienced myself, what I, what I did, was you look at the leaders that you admire most and you begin to emulate them. You begin to want to be like mm -hmm. them, right? And that's understandable at the beginning because you're kind of getting your sea legs, right? You're trying to figure right. this whole thing out. Mm -hmm. But if you stay there and you don't learn how you're wired, then all you're going to end up being is a bad copy of somebody else. The fact right. is God already made one of them. He doesn't need two. <laughs> right. You need to be you. And so mm. you have to understand how you are gifted, how you are wired. That means you understand what your gifts are, your passions, your talents, your skills. It means you understand what your personality is and how all of that works together to make you you. When you do that and you understand that, then you can leverage those things to become the best version of you you can possibly be as a person and as a leader. That's where you start. You discover mm -hmm. your wiring so you can lead from that place. But that's not where you stop. Right. Once you do that, you begin to discover the wiring of those you lead, of the mm -hmm. people who report to you, so that as a leader, you get the opportunity to pour into and invest in them to help develop them into the best version of them. Seeing them mm. not just as a cog in the machine of your organization, but seeing them as, as a person, as a 3D human being who has hopes and dreams and goals. And as a leader, I get to pour into them and help them to move toward those things. I get to help them achieve what it is that's in their heart to achieve. And you know what I've discovered when I do that? When I see people as actual human people, instead of just a, an employee or a task person, when I see them mm. as a person, I invest in them, they lean into the organization that I lead. <laughs> they lean right. into their role even more because they feel valued, right? Mm. That's not why I do it, but that's an amazing benefit from it. Right, yeah. And I like what you said about how we try to emulate people because a lot of leaders I look at in person and online are big, mm -hmm. like, fire up, fiery it was speaking in front yeah. of tens of thousands of people, all that, but I'm like incredibly introverted. And I think I read this in your book as well, is that yes. we're all different and yes. there are different ways to lead people. And by doing something that we're not, is probably actually draining and probably will lead to burnout. But if we understand what our strengths are and then also understand what our weaknesses are, we can probably get people in our team that can cover those weaknesses. And so when it comes to creating a team, 
say you have to put together, you have you and you're putting together a team to start a business or start some sort of project, whether it's church or whatever, would you recommend finding people that don't necessarily have the same leadership skills or tendencies, but have ones that complement each other so you have people that have a little bit of a mix of everything? Is that the ideal way to build a team if you had the choice? That's how I do it. Absolutely. Right. I look for complementary gifts, not identical gifts. Right. I don't want a bunch of carbon copies of me running around. That's not helpful. <laughs> I've yeah. got gaps. I've got I've got massive holes in how I lead and things I'm not great at. I need people mm. to do things I'm not great at. You know, I've got a couple of gifts. I've got a couple of skills. I want to lean mm. into those as much as I can and delegate everything else. Because right. the fact of the matter is, I don't have all the gifts. I don't have all the passions and skills and talents. Um, <laughs> and and like you said, you know, on the Myers Briggs, I'm a I'm I don't think I could be any farther on the introvert side, right? right? By virtue of what I do, I have to be in front of people. I have to talk. I have to engage people, and I do that because that's part of what my gifting requires. Mm -hmm. But that's not what in that's not what fires me up. That's not what um, that's right. not what energizes my batteries. Right. Mm -hmm. In order to be able to do that, I've got to spend time alone, reflecting, like doing what I do. I don't generate content with other people. Right. I do that <laughs> solo because right. that's how my wiring is. Right. Understanding that instead of trying to pretend to be like somebody else who does it a different way has given me the freedom and the ability to do what I do, I think, at a better level. Mm. Yeah, that's great. Cause I haven't. When I was leading teams, I probably didn't really know that much about leadership, so I was kind of winging it. But as you talk about mm -hmm. that, it reminds me a lot about my relationship with my girlfriend and like love languages is probably a similar thing, understanding, yes. <laughs> yes. right? Understanding exactly. what she likes. And for example, I've learned that I can't talk to her like she's just one of the boys. Like that's why I used to, when right. we first started dating, I just treat her just like she's one of the boys. But turns out she's a words person. And then mm. if I like make a joke or anything, like it can actually hurt her a lot. And yeah. she actually really likes to feel special. And so understanding, which is probably most girls, that's me just being an egg and learning how to be in a relationship, but that's a whole different thing. Um, <laughs> it's really good to know who the people who you are either in a team with or in a relationship with, what they love, what they're good at, how they feel valued is probably a good thing. Because yes. for example, at my work, like if I got a pay rise, I would love one, but that's not going to keep me around forever if, right. you know, that, that can only last so long. I'd rather feel like I'm a valued person of a team and feel like everyone's got my back. That would make more of a difference of me staying in a job than just getting pay rise on pay rise. Yep. So I think as leaders of the teams or in relationships or whatever it is, understanding people's skills and what they love and how they feel valued is probably a big thing, right? Yes, absolutely. You, just, you keyed directly in on it. <laughs> Money is a motivator. It is not the motivator. You know, right. The motivator, the thing that motivates most people at the greatest level is feeling like a valued part of the team, like they're seen as a person who is valuable and mm. who is valuable enough that their leader is going to pour into and invest in them. And if you if you do that as a leader, and not only do you make a difference in their life, but you get to benefit as you listen to them and you get to learn from them and you're going to grow too. You're going to get right. better because of that. Mm, yeah, that's great. Um, okay, let's talk about one one more chapter in the book. Um, and this is talking about being family focused. I'd be interested to know what you mean by that and how that's important to people's leadership. Now, I think I think that, that when I talk with leaders about this, typically when I when I say you know you have to if you want to be catalytic, you have to be family focused. The the tendency in in people to respond to that is to say something like, well. That's, that sounds great, but if I focus on my family, um, I'm going to be living out of my car in no time. Like I, I can't. I, I gotta. I gotta focus on my job. I gotta focus on what right. I do. I, I get mm -hmm. that. I understand that. But what I mean by this is, is a very simple truth. You get to decide what matters most to you. Mm -hmm. You set your priorities. You determine right. those, and you determine whether you will live in accordance with them, or live in 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 this weird amalgamation where you say one thing and do another. Mm. I've spent a lot of time with people at the end of their lives as vir by virtue of what I do. Mm. And you know what I've never heard? I've never heard anyone say, man, I wish I had spent more time at work. Right. I mean, if I had only achieved one more of our quarterly objectives or, or, or more of our KPIs, if only I had, I had mm. really accomplished this achievement. Yep. I've never heard that. You know what mm. I hear? 
I hear, man, I wish I had invested in this relationship. I wish I had spent more time with this person. Mm. That's what I hear. I hear the relational regrets. I hear right. the time regrets, the priority regrets. And I get to benefit from other people's ditches. Mm, right. I don't want to end my life with those kind of regrets. Mm. How am I going to avoid those ditches? I'm going to make different choices. By choosing to be family focused, what I mean is recognizing and, and really understanding that one day somebody else is going to sit in the chair you sit in. Somebody else right. is going to have your title. Somebody <coughs> else is going to do what you do. Mm. Right? Right. When that happens, and you're at the end of your life, what's going to matter then? It's the people closest to you. Yeah. That's what's going to matter. Yeah. Are I you think prioritizing it, them now in such a way that you're not going to have regrets then? Right. I think it's so easy for people though, like when you're in the now, when mm -hmm. you're like at work, it's so easy to get caught up in yeah. what you're doing. And because I think having priorities and having boundaries is so important because we're all so busy. Everyone's so busy these days. But actually having boundaries, like for me, I track my time and it's really interesting. Each week, I guess this is a weekly evaluation. I didn't even think about this. But each week on a Monday, I will look at how I spent my time over the past seven days. And it like ranks it. It's just an app and it just ranks it from most spent time to least spent time, right? And I can physically see. I have priorities in my head. I know what yeah. I want to prioritize in my life. <coughs> but I can physically see where I'm actually putting my time. And if that's yes. lining up with my personal boundaries and priorities. Um, so that's super powerful. I was going to go somewhere with that. Oh, yeah. So I see... Like, cause me, for me, I'm like, I, which is something, which is who I am, but it's also something I want to work on. I'm, I'm a big hustle, go hard, go fast. I want to, you know, I'm young. I want to build wealth. I want to buy a house. I want to do all this, blah, blah, blah. I have to do all this stuff before I get married, blah, blah, blah. And then I see so many people who are like young. They don't have heaps of money. They might be married and they're just so happy. I'm like, wow, like they, they're living like really basic, but they just love life. I'm like, flip, yeah. like. So it's something like we're all different, but I think it's so what, what I'm trying to illustrate by saying that is we can get so caught up in what we're doing right now. But at the end of the day, like who really cares? Like, like as long as you got your basics provided, like paid for and stuff, like who really, like everyone's different. And some people care a lot about the standard of life they have, but like there's so much more to life than just hustling at your job or hustling in your business or whatever it is. Like there's so much happiness to be had in other areas of your life. That's very easy, especially I don't want, I don't want to say especially young people, but I think a lot of people my age are so focused on the future, but then they never really like they focus on building a future, but then never really get to the point where they shift that to focusing on the present. That's Is that right. something you see? I assume absolutely. that's kind of what you mean by when you see people at the end of their life and being absolutely, uh, absolutely. They, mm. they become a victim of their lack of prioritization rather than mm. the driver of their prioritization. And, right. and the fact is you're not going to drift into the right priorities any more than you're mm. going to drift into excellence. Right. You're going to drift into the default, which is, well, I'm so busy. Well, I'm so busy. Well, I'm so... Guess what? Everybody's so busy. What right. are you busy doing? What are you busy yeah. prioritizing? Are you being right. intentional with that? Or is it just, you know, whatever happens, happens? That's most right. people. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it's crazy. I think... Do you... How, when you prioritize your sort of life, how do you think, like, you don't need to tell us specifically how you prioritize it, but, like, what are you thinking about and how do you go about, like, sort of seeing your priorities in your life? I'm a, I'm a, I'm a person of faith. Right. And so that's going to inform this. So understand that going right. into this, that I think yeah. that, that my first priority, my first priority is my relationship with my Heavenly Father. Right. Right. That's going to be top priority. That's going to be reflected mm. in my time. That's going to be reflected in mm. my priorities. My second priority, because I'm married, is my wife. We've been married right. for 24 years. And mm. that's going to be my number two priority. And the only thing mm. above that is my relationship with God. Right. After that is my relationship with my daughters. We have two girls, right? Mm. One's headed off to, to college this fall. One is finishing her freshman year of high school right now. Mm. That's great. That that Those relationships take time. They take prioritization. They're not just going to happen. I have to be very intentional with that. Mm. So... God, my wife, my kids, and then comes everything else. The problem <laughs> comes when we begin playing Jenga with this. Right. And we say, I mean, you may have heard this. I've heard this a lot. You know, people say, well, my kids are the most important thing in my life. Right. Okay, well, if you're a follower of Jesus, 
you just like took your kids and skipped a couple steps. <laughs> like, 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 careful there. Yeah. Don't say yeah. that. Not yeah. a good plan. Because when you speak it, you're creating it and you're yeah, reinforcing right. it. Don't do that. Mm-hmm. Be very careful here. I'm going to choose my priorities intentionally and I'm going to look at my week and make sure that I'm investing purposefully and intentionally in what I say matters most. Now, does that mean I'm only going to work 10 hours a week at my job? No, because I need to provide for my family. Right? right. But if I just allow my schedule to happen to me instead of driving mm. it based on my priorities, then what I'm going to find is it's going to drift into a place I don't want it to be. Right. And that's super easy to do. That's like what you're saying about drifting towards um, uh, not normal, normality, not just drifting towards what was it you said before mediocrity mediocrity yeah. that's the word and you can yeah. i guess you can do that with your time as well Absolutely. it's very easy just to slip into if you don't have a plan you know i'll be Most just watching people. netflix but right that's it you're just going to binge netflix you know you're just going <laughs> to sit on the couch and binge netflix and all of a sudden yeah. it's two in the morning and you're like what happened to my night <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah right exactly and it's probably super easy to do um i was looking ahead um that's all the chapters we plan on talking about but i'm going to tease the other ones i might talk about productivity a little bit because that's kind of like what i nerd out a little bit yeah. um so the rest of the book that's sort of the first half of the book everything we well there's a lot more and there was actually one thing i missed i might come back to it um so you have aspire for proper productivity build up people in teams never stop leading change prioritize clear communication develop other leaders and lead yourself well um, before we, we might jump into productivity really quickly, but I do want to go back to the discover your wiring part because I did miss something. Um, yeah. We talked about personality tests. What, where would you get started with those if someone wants to learn more about their personality? Because there's obviously a lot, and you talked about a few in the book. But if someone just wants an overall picture, but preferably like a free thing, where would someone go where they could go today just to learn more about their personality and what comes up and how they can apply that to their life? You know, there's so many different personality inventories. You know, the Myers-Briggs is one most people are familiar with. Uh, the DISC is another one that I use often mm. with my coaching clients because I think it's a, it's a good comprehensive view. Um, neither of those is free. The DISC is cheaper, and you can find some options for that online. A newer one that not a lot of people are familiar with yet is one that Patrick Lencioni has come out with called the Working Genius Profile with the understanding mm. that everybody has areas where they are genius. Uh, everybody has areas where they are okay, you know, I can do this. I have competency in it. And then everybody has areas where they are frustrated. And understanding what your genius areas are and what your frustration levels are really help you. And I've done this with our team so that I know where everybody's areas of genius and frustration are right. so we can task accordingly. That's that's part of discovering the wiring, not just of yourself, but of your team. All of these tools are helpful. Um, the Work in Genius, I think, is about $25 uh, to go and take that. Uh, the right. disc is twenty five to fifty dollars, depending on where you do it. Myers Briggs is going to be a little bit more, um, mm. and and you know you can find these online. Uh, but I would I would encourage you just to say, hey, I'm going to prioritize this. You know, I'm gonna right. I'm gonna choose to learn this, uh, just like you would learn any other part about yourself. Mm. Yeah, great. I think because I know when I got this new job at the start of this year, I think they got me to do it. Might have been a disc. I can't remember mm-hmm. exactly, but it was a personality test that I could tell they paid for. And yeah. it was super, it was actually crazy because the result it came up with, this was when I, was, I spent five years at McDonald's or whatever, it's where I was at high school and university and I graduated university. I'm like, I okay, cool, look for a proper job. And in that season, the result from that personality test came back as you're someone who's in a transition season. I'm like, what the, how? <laughs> like, how do they know? <laughs> it's, it's actually, I'm like, what the heck? <laughs> but yeah, no, it, t- it teaches you a lot about how you value stuff and how you prioritize stuff and where you're strong at, where you're weak at. And it's super interesting to learn because, and I found, you can tell it's not rubbish. Like it's actually like, I read it. I'm like, yep, that actually makes a lot of sense. That is me. And so definitely, if, especially if it's $25, like that's something that's super key to know. And that can lead to a lot of impact. You're going to get your $25 worth in the future years of your life. So yeah, I think absolutely. that's super interesting. I do a disc and I do a work in genius on any person who comes on our team. Right. I want them to have that information and Mm. I want to have that information so that I know how best to help them and how best to lead them. Right. Yeah, no, yeah, that's really, I think that's super important. And probably I've actually, like, I obviously did one for this new job, but I've never seen that anywhere. Any teams I've joined, nothing like you don't, I don't know what it's like in the States, but in New Zealand, you don't really see that anywhere. Like that's never really been a thing, but I definitely, if you look at, how value employees and team members are to a team like yes. that's such a worthwhile expense in my opinion if i ever yes. start yes. a team so yeah 
That's super interesting to learn. Um, if we, could, if you want to look at your whole book, or not even just your book, just your what you've learned over the past 20, 30 years of leadership, um, what do you think, if you could give someone like an actionable take, obviously you've already given heaps, but if there's one main thing, and if someone could only take one thing away from this podcast, what do you think that would be? I would say don't ever underestimate the power of a teachable spirit. Right. That is the one non-negotiable for leadership in my opinion. Mm. I think if you have that, you can get everything else. Yeah. That's, and th- that is the most important thing. Yeah. And I think a lot of people struggle with, like ego probably plays a part of that, right? Oh, like absolutely. if you have a strong ego, that's something that's hard to do. So, and you can you see a lot listening. of leadership. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And that's what then makes it really hard for people under you. If you don't feel like they're in a place where they can talk to you about stuff, then that can become a really toxic culture really quickly. And that's, that's when, right. So yeah, that's that makes a lot of sense. Thank you, thank you for saying that. Um, to finish off, and we're out of time. Um, do you want to do some rapid fire questions, and we can yeah. just see what your thoughts are about them? Okay, great. First one, I say rapid fire, but out of all the times I've done this with people, <laughs> I usually get interested and spend like five minutes on each. But we'll we'll, we'll, see, we'll see where we go. Um, what what's your favorite book? <laughs> well, I'm a pastor, so I have to say the Bible. But okay. outside the Bible, I, I right? do usually say beside the Bible, but no one's actually yeah. said the Bible. So yeah, go, go fair ahead. enough. Outside that, uh, it's the Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. I've never heard of it. Uh, What's it about? F- one of the greatest books I think in all of, of literature. Um, mm-hmm. He's it's about a man who was wrongly accused and imprisoned for something he did not do, uh. and how he had to figure out what to do next, had an opportunity, escaped prison, Mm -hmm. and because of the events that happened to him in prison, found a fortune and reinvented himself as a very, very wealthy man and spent the rest Mm -hmm. of his life getting revenge on the people who took him there, (laughs) who put him there. Mm -hmm. It It is a book about the human experience, about life, and about the futility of anger and bitterness and hatred and revenge Mm -hmm. and how the things that we think will make us happy in the end really don't right yeah wow okay that that sounds like a good choice i read that um you talk a lot about valuing your inputs in your life and you say you listen to a lot of podcasts what do you think i'm okay i'm going to assume you're going to say john maxwell but what's your favorite podcast Ooh, my favorite podcast. Wow. <laughs> you know, or that you like get the most that you get yeah. the most from. You know, there there's a bunch. Uh I would say Maxwell's is obviously one that I learn a lot from. Uh mm. Andy Stanley has a leadership podcast that I think is incredibly actionable. And that's one that I oh, find great. a lot of action items from that I can take and implement. That's right. helpful. Um Carrie Newhoff has a leadership podcast that is long form, meaning his episodes are an hour, sometimes longer. Uh, Mm. So it's it's a little bit longer of a commitment there. But again, the conversations can be so, so rich. And and there's so many things that I'll pull out of that that I can take and apply in my own leadership. Uh, Patrick Lencioni uh, has a podcast around organizational health and change Mm -hmm. that I think is is really top notch. Um, So it's hard to say one. Those are (laughs) those are the ones that, that are those are must listen to for me. No, that's great. And I, I just want to throw it out there one thing, because obviously, as I said before, I don't know if I said it before in the commu- in the intro, but we have about an hour commute to work. And so that's a really good time. Usually on my way to work, I put the audio Bible on, but on my way back from work, that's usually a good hour just listening to a podcast um, and getting something. And what I learned is someone told me this from church is he, he was a real estate agent and he listens to a real estate podcast. And his thing was only like five minutes, but he always has to take away like, an action item from each podcast he listens to. So what I've started doing, because I usually just listen to podcasts, I'm like, ah, whatever, it'll go into my brain eventually and I'll figure stuff out. But one thing I do now on my way home from work while I'm driving is I just get my phone to record. Um, I use Siri, so I don't actually use my phone, but um, I get to record like a voice memo. And so whenever I'm listening to a podcast, I'll pause it, be like, hey, Siri, record a voice memo and then just write down. What I do every time I get home from work is just take notes of everything that I say in this voice memos and so that's what I found a good way to actually take action from because you it's so easy just to listen to podcasts all the time and not actually do anything with them yes and so I found that as being a okay cool like let's actually do something like let's implement this into the business somehow or let's implement this into the team somehow so I think that's a great a great little thing 
uh, for anyone who spends a lot of time listening to podcasts and all that. Um, if you could have any mentor, dead, alive, whatever, from any time period, obviously God, but aside from God, who would who would that be in your life? I think it would be George Washington. Mm. Okay. Here's somebody who was a leader kind of against their will a little bit. You know, he didn't mm. seek out the leadership role that he ended up being in. And he had to lead in such a way that brought unity in a time when unity was not normal. <laughs> right. Nobody had ever seen what he was trying to build. Mm. And after he served two terms, everybody around him was telling him to keep going. And they wanted mm. to make him something that he was not. And mm. he laid it down. And he right. said, no, I want to go back to being a farmer. I want to go back to being a, a landowner. I, I'm, I'm done with this chapter. Mm. Even though everybody around him wanted him to continue. And I'm sure we're plying him with accolades and affirmations and compliments. And he laid mm. it down. And I've always been impressed by that. I've always right. been impressed by a leader who has that kind of humility Mm. And that kind of strong understanding that leadership is a temporary thing we are entrusted with. Right. It is not something that we are to use for our own benefit. It is always to be used for the benefit of other people. So mm. I would I would love to have an extended conversation with them. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, I, as a non-American, I just learned a lot about George Washington. So, so thank you for that. Yeah, that's, that's a great way to... I think that's a great way to end. I actually saw... Oh, one thing that's crazy was you got the George Washington statue in New York in front of the mm-hmm. what's it in front of the um I've never uh, been to New York, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then like on the side, there's like some other building to the side in Manhattan, and there's like um all these like shrapnel holes in the building, and that's from like the eighteen hundreds or something crazy. Mm-hmm. Well, some dude had like this massive bomb that exploded and they just kept it there because it's like historical now. I'm like, it's the most buzzy thing. I'm like, this is not cool that there's an explosion, but like, <laughs> right. like it's crazy that they just left it. And you can see like, this explosion that happened like 200 years ago and that's just a part of American history. I'm like, yeah. well, okay. Not really relevant. I just found that super interesting. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, okay. If, well, first of all, thank, thanks so much for jumping on, William. I like, even myself, I learned a lot. And I think you've given us so many actionable things that we can write down take notes on and apply to our lives as leaders as as partners and people in relationships i think this is people are going to get a lot from this and so thank you so much um if people could want to find out more about you find out more about your teachings find your book where should they go to find all that information you can go to catalyticleadership.net and you can find out more about what I do and the coaching that I provide for leaders, the one-on-one coaching that I do. Uh, mm. For the book, I would love to offer your podcast listeners a, a free copy of the book. My goal is to mm. get this into as many hands as I can because I okay. want people to benefit from this. I want them to benefit from what's been invested in me and I want to share it forward. So right. if you go to catalyticleadershipbook.com, uh, mm. you can get a free copy of the book. Oh, I didn't even know about that. <laughs> okay. Great. I have read the book, but that's amazing. Is that just is that just out there? Yep. Absolutely. Sweet. Okay. Oh, yeah, amazing. I'll, we'll put all the links and everything in the show notes, put on YouTube, wherever you're watching this, all those links will be available for you guys to check out. So again, William, thank you so much for jumping on. Really appreciate your time. People are going to learn a lot and they get a free book out of it. So thank you so much. I, I, I just want, actually, nah, I want to honor you about what you're doing with leadership because I can tell you don't just do this because as a job but you do this because you actually value it. You see that the value in other people. And I think what you're doing is incredible. I honor you. I respect you. And so thank you for doing what you're doing. Keep doing it and all the best for the future. And thanks so much. I appreciate that. And I appreciate you having me on. Hey, thanks so much for checking out this week's episode of the Son of Man podcast. I hope it brought you as much value as it did to me. And if you did enjoy it, I'd really appreciate if you could leave a five-star review wherever you're listening to this. It really help more ambitious Christians just like yourself all around the world get some of this knowledge that we discussed today. Also, if you'd like to dive deeper into any of the topics we discussed today, I've actually got a free private Facebook group uh, that is filled with people just like yourself, people who are trying to achieve their God dreams, that you can head over. The link will be in the show notes or in the description below and go check that out. Anyway, guys, hope you have a great day. I'll be back here next time, same time, same place, next week. And I'll see you guys there. Peace out.